Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, big thanks to all of you for finding time to attend. Uh, my name is Leah, and I am the research manager at Daksh. Uh, Daksh is a nonprofit based in Bangalore that works on judicial reforms. The topic for today's webinar is lawyers' experiences during COVID. Uh, to discuss this topic, we have an esteemed panel. Uh, let me just introduce the panel before we start the webinar. Uh, first, we have Justice uh, Pratibha M. Singh from uh, Delhi High Court. Uh, she is a graduate of the University Law College, Bangalore. She graduated as the first rank holder from Bangalore University and also represented India at the Phillips C. Jessup Moot, Co Moot Court Competition in Chicago, USA. Uh, she was offered the ODASSS scholarship by the Cambridge Commonwealth Trust to study LLM at the University of Cambridge. Before being elevated to the bench, she was leading. She was a leading intellectual property lawyer in India. She had the distinction of handling landmark matters in all matters of IP laws, including patents, trademarks, designs, copyright, plant varieties, and internet laws. As the managing partner of Singh & Singh, she advised clients and handled cases relating to commercial disputes, arbitration, telecom, broadcasting laws, regulatory issues, and education. She has regularly appeared before the Honorable Supreme Court of India, High Court of Delhi, TDSAT, IPAB, and the Trademark and Patents Offices. She was appointed as amicus curiae by the High Court of Delhi to streamline the working of the Copyright Office. She was also appointed on a high-level committee for streamlining of patent examinations. Our next panelist is uh, Nikita Sonwane. Uh, she graduated with a BA in Political Science from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, and an LLB from Government Law College, Mumbai. She holds an LLM in Law and Development from the Azim Premji University. She has worked as a legal researcher and an advocate for three years. Uh, she's the co-founder of the Criminal Justice and Police Accountability Project, a Bhopal-based litigation and research initiative focused on building accountability against the criminalization of marginalized communities by the police and criminal justice system. She has previously worked as a research associate with the Center for Social Justice, Ahmedabad, on issues of local governance, forest rights, gender in Adivasi regions of Dank in Gujarat. Our third panelist is Mr. Vivekanand Panyala. Mr. Vivekanand Panyala is a practicing advocate from Mangaluru. He has founded a law firm called Panyala & Associates. He holds a master's in law and has secured the first rank in LLM from Karnataka State Law University. He is also the recipient of the Nani A. Palkiwala gold medal. Uh, his practice includes arbitration law, commercial suits, and civil cases. He has set up a trust called the Center for Legal Research and Remedies, which is espousing public interest causes like human rights besides class actions. He has put in 25 years of practice in the bar. He is the founder of the first arbitration center in Mangalore. He is also a member of the syndicate of the Mangalore University. Today's webinar will be anchored around Daksh's recent report on its rapid review of experiences of district court lawyers in accessing courts during COVID-19. Uh, the shutdown of courts and the transition to online hearings provided a great opportunity to researchers like us to study how such hearings were implemented. We decided to focus the study on district courts because a lot of media coverage on online hearings focused on high courts and the Supreme Court. The experiences of district court lawyers and staff were relegated to the margins and we therefore wanted to highlight these experiences. Uh, we will begin the webinar with a short presentation on Daksh's study. After that, each of the speakers will uh, make some opening remarks, which will be followed by a discussion. We will then open it up for audience questions. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat box in on YouTube, and we will take them after the discussion. I'll just start the uh, presentation. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. 
Yes. Okay, so um, I'll just begin with a brief introduction of the methodology of this study. Uh, so uh, because of the time limit, we wanted to finish this study quite fast. Because of the time restrictions, we used a sampling method called the snowball sampling method, which means that we contacted uh, lawyers who are in our networks and we asked them to uh, recommend uh, or refer lawyers in their networks uh, for the survey. So this is not a random sampling method. This is what is called snowball sampling. Uh, the universe of uh, lawyers sampled was 124. Uh, these were spread across three states. I'll describe that in the next slide. Uh, the methods we used to as ascertain the views of these lawyers were focus group, uh, were um, online interviews uh, and focus group discussions. So the online surveys we did on a uh, on a software called uh, Survey Monkey. This was to uh, ascertain their view, their experiences of uh, COVID nineteen, both when courts were shut and when courts reopened. We conducted in-depth interviews and focus group discussions with 27 of these 124 lawyers because we wanted to know more about uh, their experiences. For example, if they said that they were uncomfortable with e-filing, we wanted to know what made them uncomfortable. So that is why we did some in-depth interviews as well. We also uh, did secondary research, which consisted of court directions, notifications, and guidelines because we wanted to know um, what the uh, court uh, directions were regarding the movement to online hearing. Uh, these are some more details of the study. In terms of uh, the places where the study was conducted, we, uh, we identified three states. We tried to have a geographic spread across India. So the states were Delhi, Madhya Pradesh, and Karnataka. Uh, in Delhi, we looked at two districts, Shahadraya and Central Delhi. In Karnataka, four districts, Bengaluru Urban, Dakshina Kannada, and Kalaburgi. In Madhya Pradesh, again, we looked at four districts, uh, Bhopal, Badwani, Morena, and Sidi. Uh, in the states also, we tried to have a mix of urban, peri-urban and rural districts because we wanted this survey to be as representative as possible. As mentioned earlier, uh, this is a rapid review. So the uh, period of the review was 1st July 2020 to 20th September 2020. What motivated us to do this study? For researchers like us, uh, this kind of a transition to online hearings provided an unexpected experiment to study the effectiveness of such hearings. So uh, it was an unprecedented move, but for us, it was a great opportunity to actually see how effective these hearings were uh, and related processes such as e-filing and e-payments. So uh, once the uh, lockdown was announced, uh, the Supreme Court gave a set of directives uh, to the uh, high courts regarding how courts were to function during this period. So the Supreme Court and the high courts were to take all measures to reduce the need for physical presence. Uh, the high court, each, every high court was authorized to determine the modalities which were suitable according to the conditions in their state for the temporary transition to the use of video conferencing facilities. Courts were also uh, directed to maintain a helpline to help with complaints regarding the quality or the audibility of the feed. District courts in each state were to adopt the mode of video conferencing as prescribed by their high court. How these uh, directives were actually implemented in the district courts, the ones we surveyed. So um, in terms of the cases that were heard, only urgent cases were heard. This meant uh, for criminal, uh, ba only bail cases were heard. In civil, it was mostly injunction cases that were heard. The determination of urgency was by the, by the registry. Uh, from the whatever we had gathered from the survey. So uh, the bail matters are quite simple, but to what kind of an injunction matter is urgent, that was uh, decided by the registry. Uh, the he online hearings were through various video conferencing platforms, depending on the state. So uh, Zoom was used in some states. Other states used Jitsi Meet, WebEx. In parts of Madhya Pradesh, where there was a problem with internet connectivity, WhatsApp was also used. Uh, since uh, since uh, courts wanted to avoid crowding, uh, they uh, instituted e-filing. But um, however, e-filing in a lot of districts was followed up by physical filing. This is because the uh, entire process is not yet digitized. So physical records still remain. So in a lot of places, the e-filing had to be followed by physical filing, which made, it a, which made the e-filing a little redundant. 
Interim orders uh, continued in force in most in all the districts we surveyed. And um, apart from urgent cases, all other cases were adjourned. These are the main findings of the survey. So uh, the digital divide, I mean, everybody knows that in India, we have a major digital divide and uh, that uh, in large parts of rural and semi-urban India, uh, internet connectivity and knowledge of how to operate these systems is not very high. So we saw we, that was reflected in the findings of the survey as well. So lawyers in semi-urban and rural districts found online hearings challenging. Uh, some of them didn't have the devices to access, uh, access these hearings. So in Madhya Pradesh, actually, in a lot of the districts, uh, booths were set up in the courts where lawyers could go and attend the online hearings. Uh, so although the, I mean, this helped with bridging the digital divide, but it led to uh, quite a bit of crowding in the courts. So physical distancing was difficult to enforce. Um, so these lawyers also, because they still had to travel to the court to attend online hearings, they didn't uh, find these hearings as convenient as lawyers who sat in their houses or offices and attended did. Uh, the second finding was related to open courts. So Indian courts function on an open courts principle where all the proceedings are held in open court and the public can watch and uh, even the media has access to courts. Uh, once uh, hearings moved online, this principle was not followed. So in um, all the districts that we surveyed, the public did not have access to these hearings. Um, the, in, the litigants were allowed in some cases, but uh, across the board, public did not have access to these hearings. The other major finding was related to under trial production. So in a physical hearing, uh, the under trial prisoner is produced before the judge. Uh, what happened with um, online hearings was this became discretionary. So in some in some courts in Delhi, uh, under trials were produced. But in Madhya Pradesh, most of the lawyers told us that under trials were not produced. So this is quite a, a glaring omission. So the production of under trials is very important because it gives the judge an opportunity to actually interact and ask the under trial uh, how he's been treated, uh, whether there's been any custodial torture, things like that. So that is quite a glaring omission. The other issue we found was uh, related to the architecture of the platforms. So um, the platforms that were used for these hearings were actually video, uh, were video regular video conferencing platforms, which are used generally for meetings in other organizations. Uh, these platforms don't replicate the experience of an actual court. So for example, um, in most cases, uh, there's no uh, provision for, a, uh, for the uh, under trial to speak in private to his lawyer. So um, in, in, a, in a physical court, there, there would be space for him to have a private conversation uh, with his lawyer, but uh, in the architecture of these platforms doesn't allow that. Uh, the last issue was again regarding e-filing. So as I had said, in most places, because the transition to this, uh, to online modes of working was so sudden, uh, the physical uh, mode of working still continued. So although e-filing was allowed, it had to be followed up with physical filing. Uh, some of the lawyers also told us that uh, they, found it, they found the process of e-filing really cumbersome because of uh, there were limitations on file sizes, file types, and uh, they had to compress the files and then the files just became illegible. In terms of uh, the way forward, uh, taking into account all the findings uh, of the survey, uh, these were some of the, uh, we, these were some of the, uh, our, our recommendations for the way forward. The first is assistance. So taking into account the digital divide in the country, uh, there is a need for uh, assisting lawyers and litigants with online modes of working. So uh, a lot of lawyers were really lost with uh, this kind of, uh, this transition that was really sudden. So there is a need for FAQs, call uh, helplines, you know, uh, videos, help. Uh, assisting videos and things like that. Uh, the other uh, recommendation that we have is uh, stakeholder engagement on the kind of cases and the stages that are suitable for online hearings. So what we were, uh, what we gleaned from these lawyers is that there are certain stages, for example, uh, 
in the evidence stage, which are not really suitable for online hearings. And even in terms of cases, not all cases are suitable for online hearings. It depends on the level of contestation of the case. So uh, there is a need for um, you know, the judiciary and the bar and other stakeholders to engage on and uh, figure out which are the cases that can continue with online hearings even once things normalize. High speed internet is again a very important factor. Um, as I had said in the semi-urban and rural areas, because of uh, bad connectivity, the lawyers had a very poor experience with uh, online hearings. The other thing was, um, uh, the other recommendation is that uh, there needs to be an SOP for emergencies like this. So this, even if this, even if we don't see another pandemic in our lifetime, there may be other um, emergencies that come up which require courts to move to online hearings. So it would be useful to have uh, an SOP that lays down the steps so that it's clear to everyone how to go about it. Here, there was a lot of uh, panic. And I mean, the courts did their best, but it would always be useful if there could be an SOP to guide them. That's all with my presentation. Now uh, we can go to the opening remarks. Uh, I'd request uh, Justice Singh to share her thoughts. A very good evening uh, to all the viewers and uh, to the co-panelists. Uh, thank you very much for calling me on the Dutch platform because I have read several of your reports and uh, I think you're doing a very commendable job. And I must congratulate you on, on doing such a good research, uh, having such a good research platform, uh, which not only helps uh, the general public and litigants, but I think uh, mostly it serves as a kind of a check for even judges. So we are able to check as to what uh, is the feedback on the steps and the measures that we are taking from time to time. And uh, I think the research policy area of uh, in, in relating to law has become so much more vibrant, I think, in the last five to seven years. And owing to all platforms like you and Vidhi, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is a time to congratulate all of you. And a very happy new year. Wish, wishing everybody a wonderful year and a great decade ahead with online online uh, interactions more and more. I don't think I. I think we started the decade with the pandemic, but uh, which which followed with the online platforms. But even if the pandemic goes away, I think the online platforms are platforms are here to stay. And uh, I just want to have you know kind of a conversation and tell you all what was my experience uh, you know I was in the I'm on the IT committee in the Delhi High Court and uh, uh, immediately after the lockdown we were already used to electronic files and electronic cases in the court I didn't use paper in my office all my files in the evening they would come on a hard drive to my house so I never got files in bags as 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 normal judges as we all do so in the high court we have about 15 judges who are all e-courts so we were already electronic in that sense partially and uh, when the lockdown happened um i must say for the first one week or 10 days i was really happy to peacefully stay at home do nothing and then you know enjoy the family and food and the atmosphere and then it hits it hits you it just hits you as to what are you doing and why are you doing this? How come there are no there are no better measures to keep the justice system rolling? It's I think it hit everybody, and slowly and slowly, I mean things came on track, and uh, I think Delhi High Court was one of the first high courts to really open up VC hearings, even thrice a week. I think we opened up initially with four benches, and then slowly and slowly we've now we had opened up the entire court in the last six months or so. And uh, we have really enjoyed it. The platform which we have chosen has been excellent. The WebEx platform, not to say that there are not other platforms which are efficient. And uh, nowadays I get the feeling that most lawyers don't want to go back to physical court. That's the feeling I get because they're so happy and so used to this platform. They feel they save a lot of time and it's quality time. They're able to do their work. 
they don't need to pick up their car drive down in delhi's traffic jams reach the court find a parking hang around in the canteen waiting for their main matters and here they they can just wait keep themselves video and audio muted wait for the judge to call their matter and then bank their they present their case and then they're off i think uh, it has made it very efficient but i do think that we miss the social interactions which we used to have all the fun and frolic of courts the happiness and the sheer vibrancy of the court corridors that is really missed and uh, i i'm not sure how the future is going to be but i have a little presentation for you all uh, to just show you what delhi high court has done but uh, you know before going into all that i only want to say that uh, i have met a large number of people in online platforms during this period and it's been an absolute pleasure meeting everyone from across the world doing webinars doing conferences and uh, i don't think i would have met so many people physically if i was you know not using the online platform so before uh, i go further let me share my screen i have a short presentation this is just to show you as to what the high court is doing and uh, i did read your report i must say and uh, they have some very inter uh, interesting findings we'll come to that after the presentation uh, okay so please tell me how much time i have left because i don't want to violate my time uh, limitations uh, about 6 uh, 7 minutes 6 7 minutes more yeah, yeah okay yeah. all right so there i go one second Are you able to see it? Uh, not yet. Not yet. Application window. Is this okay? No. Uh. Ah, uh, wait a minute. Yeah. It's okay. Good. All right. So let's just run through this quickly. is it moving le ah uh, yes it is ma'am okay so i've just mentioned this to you and uh, let's uh, let's do let's just run through the whole process of what happens in the delhi high court we file by email we have e filing uh, proper protocols in place and uh, when the registry high court registry receives the e file the it department prepares a portfolio and the matter is list cleared for listing in this the number of objections etc have been kept to a complete minimum the only two three things that the registry looks at is whether the advance copy has been served we don't look for uh, attested affidavits we need emails of all parties which have to be provided and then a listing list is prepared by the high court the court master is then sent the list by the registry court master contacts all the counsels the assess he assesses the time needed for hearing and then fixes time slots of 15 to 20 minutes for each case now mind you this was what we started doing by giving separate slots for each case so when the uh, court master orally informs and takes the consent of all counsels he allots slots for all the for all the matters the stenographer is available online and the law researcher is also available online the court master then signs into the webex platform using his username and password and then the he sends out emails to all the counsels the stenographer and the law researcher as also the judge now the you know the peshi it's a very old word which is used the case files are sent by the it cell of the high court to the judge by email the judge downloads all the portfolios and then the judge assembles in robes in front of the monitor on the date of the hearing that's at 10:30 in the morning the court master hosts the vc hearing he dials in and all counsels dial in hearing is held submission is heard order is dictated and it's finalized in the evening it's digitally signed by the judge we have digital signatures the ps then converts the order from microsoft to a pdf format and uploads the same on the same day or at best the next day 
So this is how an email looks for a meeting invitation. I don't think you all need to know it. You know how to join meetings, etc., etc. This was the process which was being followed at least three months till three months ago. But recently, we realized that the number of urgent matters has, you know, really, really increased a lot. So then, a number of judges, including myself, we started having an open link in the cause list itself. So as on today, I I will use an open link uh, uh, VC hearing. Anyone can join through this open link, including journalists, reporters, litigants, lawyers, anyone who wants to look at any matter. So I'm sure that could include Vidhi and Daksha or your Daksha as well. So I'm sure this is uh, this is actually working very efficiently, and uh, this is also helping uh, people to know as to what's happening in the court and how the judge reacts. They're able to assess the judge beautifully, and uh, they a large number of lawyers are able to mention out of turn. Suppose someone needs an adjournment, they don't need to wait for their slot. They just mention at 10.30, just like in an open court, and then they go away. And uh, so this open link system is really working uh, perfectly. Now, the PESHI of the IT cell, the IT cell sends us the PESHI in this manner. These are, for example, these are attachments with our, uh, with the email. Please see how a portfolio looks of any case. So we have an order, order portfolio, a pleading portfolio, an application portfolio, office notings. For example, whatever the registry wants to tell us in a particular case, the documents which are filed by parties. If there is evidence, it's record, it's a separate folder. And then you have a miscellaneous folder. So this portfolio reaches the judge. Each of the portfolios are bookmarked and it's very easy to access the documents. So we have one portfolio for the plaintiff, one folder for the plaintiff, one for the defendant. This is the way, the way I use uh, online VC hearings is to have a split screen in a big monitor. So one is the meeting window, one is the document window. So I don't need to look at, like right now, I'm looking at the presentation on one side and you all on the other side. So there is uh, no, uh, there is complete eye connect all the time. And uh, you don't have to be looking at two separate screens. Uh, you don't uh, have problems with uh, sitting for long time. And you know, lawyers are also getting used to sharing of screen. So lawyers have shared screens, they've highlighted issues. This is just about a publication in a newspaper. So pleadings are in one half, there's a share screen, and then there is the tabs which are there. Now, then there are practice directions for e-filing. Delhi High Court has a proper video, which is there in the website to show you how to prepare uh, the bookmarking of files and to how to prepare for portfolios. E-filing can be exempted uh, if there are any, you know, uh, any of these situations. So we do have an SOS facility as well. Now, all advocates and litigants who do not have access to the requisite facilities, we've prepared, uh, there are counters in the Delhi High Court where a court clerk can go with the, with the hard copy file. So it will be converted for a very nominal charge. And then the whole conversion takes place into a, an e-file. And uh, normal size is 50 MB. And if it is more than 50 MB, you can get it done from the designated center in the High Court. So my, my own experience is that the system is very easy to operate. All the 29, 30 judges in the High Court, we all use VC facilities. The hearings are very quiet, very fast and seamless. We can mute lawyers when they want, which we can't do in physical hearings, which is quite fun. And uh, lawyers usually don't need to wait long. There is a lot of time, time saving which happens. So the way I look at way forward is uh, live streaming would take place of court proceedings with usernames and passwords so that most lawyers can even watch the streaming that's happening, even if we go into physical court. Lawyers can get access with unique IDs and passwords. They can also view the portfolios which we use. And so lawyers and courts are at the same uh, platform on the portfolios. So monitors are also can also be provided in courtrooms, which I think Delhi High Court is now planning. So that when a lawyer comes, he can just plug in his laptop or his tab and then look at the portfolio and get it and argue on that basis. We don't need to make copies of judgments anymore or compilations. We can make use of electronic documents. And the way I look at it, going forward, I think hybrid hearings may be the preferred format. All courts would have monitors from where lawyers who cannot come physically can just dial in 
to the court and wait for their turn. This would also enable litigants from across the globe to view hearings and also lead to a robust judicial system that would be created in the coming decade. So this was a small cartoon. Finally, a computer whose inner workings even an old judge can understand. I consider one of myself as one of the old judges. So this has been a real pleasure, the VC hearings. And uh, while I miss going to the, uh, you know, enjoying lunch and dinner and tea with my colleague judges and other staff, etc. I mean, in the pandemic, this is like the optimum utilization that we are doing so that the wheels of justice keep grinding. Some funny experiences I've had. We can look at all lawyers, homes and offices just the way we are looking at Mr. Panyala's office right now. And we know what are their tastes. And uh, in a large number of conferences and webinars, I've seen uh, women lawyers whose pressure cookers are, uh, you know, uh, whistling out. So they know they are cooking on one side and they're hear doing hearings on the other, other side. In one conference, I remember a lady judge from Italy in the Italian Milan, Milan High Court. She had a maid who had come in for cooking. So we could actually hear all the vessels and the utensils. And she was like, pardon me, this is the time when my maid comes in. I have heard vegetable sellers who are selling outside the lawyers' homes when they are joining video conferences. We've had children who've come into video conference hearings and there are dogs and pets who've come into VC hearings. So I think it's overall been a fun time and uh, we've all used our time very effectively. And I must say that the report is very interesting. It's thrown up some excellent uh, findings and I would be using some of these to you know, try and see how we can improve the district courts functioning in Delhi. And uh, thank you for the wonderful report. Uh, if not for this uh, webinar invite, I may have never read it. So thank you for you know, uh, bringing me, uh, make me, making me conscious of this. And uh, I do think that Delhi does have an advantage, which is the refrain in your entire report, because we have better internet connectivity in Delhi. I think uh, we do have an advantage, but it's only a question of time. It won't be very long before the entire country is online. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, uh, Justice Singh. Uh, now I'd request uh, Mr. Panyala to make his opening remarks. Uh, you're muted, Mr. Panyala. Good evening. My experience is almost like that of uh, Justice Singh, how beautifully it has been shared. Uh, the first and foremost, uh, uh, thing which I would like to share here is that when the whole system collapsed due to the pandemic related uh, lockdown, there were only two important departments functioning at the district level. I, I speak from the standpoint of uh, a district bar. Now here it was the health department and the police department. All other executive functions were uh, uh, came to a grinding halt. At this stage, we were also not sure as to what to do, how do we handle this, because it is unprecedented. But uh, the greatest thing which I must say is that the judiciary has lived up to the expectations. The Supreme Court, Honorable Supreme Court has taken Suomota cognizance and issued the set of guidelines uh, emphasizing that the just access to justice will not be disrupted or in any way the common man who wanted to avail this uh, uh, justice from the courts of law will not be uh, affected. This is the most beautiful thing that has happened. What's happened immediately, the court started functioning. This gave a lot of uh, hope to the common man and particularly for the lawyers to come and tell that here is a judiciary which is uh, uh, very much concerned about the grievances of the common man and the justice delivery system is not uh, in any way paralyzed, yes, definitely it has been, there are challenges, there were limitations, but it functioned fully. Uh, the Supreme Court has issued the directives, immediately the high courts have uh, come up with the standard operative procedures, then uh, the court started functioning. The, uh, the things, the, there was a sincere effort on the part of the judiciary to make the functioning very normal. This is uh, the greatest thing and uh, I personally feel as an advocate, I'm really proud of this system. 
because when all other departments nearly for six to seven months collectorate was not working corporation was not working various departments they started they took shelter under this uh, pandemic and uh, they did not uh, respond to the needs of the people whereas judiciary exceptionally responded and the access of justice was not affected that's a one uh, beautiful thing and secondly my experience with the judges is that when we are in the court hall we are always uh, uh, on the spotlight the judge will be watching the uh, colleagues are watching court staff are watching public are watching witnesses even the people who have come to the neighboring court the next court hall will also come and uh, watch you so in this case what has happened the spotlight was only on me that is between the judge and the advocate so they, it was a beautiful connect this is a unique experience which i had because initially i was little uh, skeptical whether uh, judges will be able to hear us give us the but the judges give maximum importance to each and every individual that is one thing which i feel that uh, the the relationship between the judiciary there's a bar and the bench i think it has gone to the next level it is one to one communication and direct uh, communication and uh, the importance of the case that is presented judge was able to give a special audience so that is another important thing that i would like to share and the third thing is that when i was sitting in my chamber and uh, making submission before the honorable judges my clients would sit at the corner of my chamber and watch what kind of presentation i am making and how the honorable judge is reacting what are the queries raised by the honorable judge and how the uh, judge is trying to understand my grievances my case so the clients were pretty impressed by the um, kind of involvement of the because uh, normally we do not see the live streaming of the judicial proceedings there is no scope for that and also all are not uh, able to come and watch the physical hearing not only clients even the public at large but in this case when my clients they observed the way in which the proceedings were conducted they were pretty impressed and they uh, the, the perception that the judiciary is uh, uh, archaic and it is very slow all these things were removed so clients were pretty impressed by the advancement in the in the technology and how the judiciary is quickly responding to that so this is one good thing which uh, has uh, happened then yes sitting in mangalore i could uh, address some of the arguments before the honorable high court judge of uh, uh, bangalore i was able to practice both in the high court as well as district court at the same time by using this technology i was able to take up some of the matters and uh, uh, despite uh, limitations of technology disruptions poor connectivity the honorable high court judge was very accommodative uh, will not uh, adjourn the case or will not dismiss it or will not uh, the honorable judge would simply pass it over kept by and later on see whether the lawyer is able to get reconnected establish the uh, connection uh, so i i used to uh, come in the afternoon and uh, then still my case is in the list i could uh, request the honorable judge that i i, I may be permitted to uh, make my submissions so this is something wonderful this has given uh, a new hope and uh, as uh, uh, justice singh has rightly uh, mentioned it's going to be hybrid we are we 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 would like uh, the system to continue and also physical hearing system to continue and as far as e filing is concerned we did not find it uh, much difficult uh, difficulty in handling the situation the reason being uh, during the first 5 to 6 months time there were not too many injunction applications except a uh, uh, cases of uh, invocation of bank guarantee because that had uh, posed lot of uh, financial crisis so companies uh, we are trying to invoke the bank guarantee at that time we had to move the application other than that the litigations had come down it was more in the more or less peaceful society so there was no urgency there was no imminent or immediate danger so there was no nothing urgency to move an application or a suit for injunction so society was by and large was uh, uh, not so active so we could not find much illegalities or much uh, uh, actions on the part of the establishment executive like issuance of uh, show cause notice for demolition of the building or any such cause of actions there were not many litigations so i did not face the problem of moving uh, emergent matters then as far as uh, only one i would say a small demerit is that we were asked to make both the e filing as well as physical filing so since it was a new experience yes court staff did uh, 
uh, feel some challenge. They had to face this because of the sanitization process. So uh, in the process, we need to wait for three to five days the file to reach the honorable judge. So there we felt that the papers were not moving uh, uh, within the, uh, the within the expected time. However, uh, soon within a 15 to 20 days time, it was resolved. Uh, if I make a submission saying that I've already filed it, it has not reached the court, then the court always uh, considered it very favorably, uh, very leniently accommodative. So other than that, there, I had no problem as far as the e-payment is concerned, since the Honorable Supreme Court had extended the period of limitation, there was no need, there was no hurry to file the uh, suit for recovery of money or any other uh, uh, petitions, uh, even arbitrary interim applications uh, on a priority basis. So we did not face any challenge in making the e-payment. So these are my mixed experience, but by and large, I would say I'm extremely happy with the way the judiciary has responded. And uh, I've been very much, uh, uh, the system has been very much relevant and useful to the common man. I did not see any disruption in the justice dispensation uh, whole process. That's my experience. Thank you, Mr. Banyala. Uh, Nikita, uh, over to you. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. And thank you for this very important study this, that Daksha has conducted during this period. Uh, also, thank you to my fellow panelists, Justice Singh and Mr. Panyala. I'm uh, very happy to be here today and share my thoughts. I want to, so I practice uh, in the district court of Bhopal, uh, which is one of the sites where the study was conducted. So I want to begin by addressing some of the questions uh, and some of the issues that have already been addressed in the study conducted by Daksh. And I also want to elaborate on some of those uh, issues that have been raised in the study with experiences, uh, you know, that I have my own experiences as a litigating lawyer during this period. So I, I want to start by also, uh, you know, addressing the questions of non-accessibility uh, and its impact, particularly its impact on criminal cases. So majority of the matters uh, that I work on here in Bhopal are criminal cases. So I want to talk about the particular impact of the lockdown and you know the, the transition to a virtual system of hearing during this period, uh, its impact on the criminal justice system. Uh, and by the criminal justice system, I mean judges, the judiciary, of course, but also uh, litigants and lawyers alike. So I think also when we're addressing these questions, I want to locate it within uh, the larger limitations of accessing justice uh, you know, that have emerged within the context of the criminal justice system and these certain long standing issues uh, that the justice delivery system has faced in this country for a while now. So I want to begin first by talking about a bit about uh, hurdles to accessibility that came in place when the virtual system was put up, right? So, I mean, this is a system that we had to transition to overnight and it was in response to an unprecedented health crisis that we continue to battle. And so there were certain you know, questions and certain pitfalls that emerged while we were move, trying to transition to this system. A major uh, question was, and that was the delay of listing matters. So uh, I remember when the lockdown happened and we were trying to figure out, particularly you know, when the Supreme Court passed an order saying urgent matters would be heard, we were trying to figure out how it would be possible for us uh, for to get matters listed at a time, you know, when it was unprecedented and for the first time we had seen uh, the court building being locked. So we were trying to figure out how this would work out. And we saw that, you know, we were told that we would have to send emails for matters to be listed. And that's how uh, we'd be able to get a hearing. And while this was useful to a lot of lawyers such as myself who have access to a laptop, uh, and technology and a smartphone, you know, it was possible for us to uh, sit in the comfort of our home and, you know, send an email uh, to the district bar registry to get a matter listed. There were a lot of questions that emerged for fellow members of the bar, given their non-accessibility and non-familiarity with technology, right? So there are a lot of lawyers uh, who not only do not have access to computers and laptops, but also do not own smartphones. So these were lawyers who uh, suffered immensely during this period because they lost clients uh, and, you know, they were, I mean, of course, regular hearings had come to a halt, but they were also unable to assist clients uh, 
who had a urgent bail applications and other matters and needed to access the system during this period so what we saw that there were a few lawyers who were majorly you know appearing before the court and were majorly the ones who were filing matters and i think what has happened is that during this time lawyers who did not have access to smartphones and did not have access to technology were ones like i said who lost out clients and also we saw that there has been this sort of monopoly of a few lawyers and of course this over dependence of litigants on those lawyers to be able to access the system i mean over a period of time particularly in recent times we have seen the sort of critiques of the system of senior counsels and uh, you know the focus of a few lawyers and the dependence of a few lawyers on the system being made and i think we saw uh, that sort of dependence being particularly exacerbated during this period like the report also mentioned you know in the context of madhya pradesh the court of course responded to this issue by installing uh, you know computers and laptops within the court lobby and these booths were set up as leah also mentioned in her presentation but this of course came at a risk of having to put one self in a place where you know physical distancing norms were violated so this came at the risk of exposing oneself uh, to the virus in order to be able to access the system and like the report also says that you know we were like the filing system right so the filing system was happening virtually i remember we were trying to get a pil uh, a writ petition filed in the high court during this period and we spent an enormous amount of time trying to figure out how to compress uh, this vast document what form had to put it in and so these were some of the challenges that lawyers who had access to technology but moreover lawyers who didn't have access to this system faced and i think i mean there's one particular incident uh, that i want to highlight which is we were arguing a bail matter in an ndps case and this was in the month of april uh, which was soon after the lockdown was imposed and we were trying to argue in a bail matter like i said in an ndps case and we logged into the system so the mp high court and the district courts have both been using this platform called jitsi uh, which is a useful open source platform and works uh, better than most other platforms do and so we logged in and at that point it wasn't possible the system they hadn't figured out devised the system to connect us to a particular court so there were m- multiple courts that would show up on the same screen so like we are all able to you know like the four of us uh, in this particular place are now you know are visible on the screen at that point there were four judges on the screen and of course because they were operating out of the court building they were all wearing masks so we were wondering which judge we were actually trying to argue the matter before because it was incredibly confusing because there were four judges on the screen wearing masks and of course taking all the required precautions and it was difficult for us to find out which judge we were actually supposed to argue the matter before so there were these confusions uh, that came in the place you know as mr panyala said it i mean now of course the system has developed for us to have a one to one conversation and to be able to argue the matter with a judge on a one to one basis but i think especially in bail matters uh, for us as criminal lawyers i think it makes a world of difference to be able to have an audience with a judge in person and so the district court here in mp has now evolved the system where we have virtual hearings on alternate days with of course the required precautions uh, but these are certain challenges that emerged when it came to accessing the system of virtual hearings during this period i also want to focus a little bit about the particular impact on criminal cases right so of course uh, when the lockdown happened and you know we were trying to grapple with this pandemic the supreme court uh the honorable supreme court rightfully stepped up and said that only urgent matters would be heard but there was some lack of clarity in the absence of you know any sort of explication on what these urgent matters would entail so for instance uh the constitutional court of south africa had an exhaustive list of what would constitute urgent matters uh here it was left up to the discretion of the courts to decide what would constitute urgent matters of course you know in bail matters across the board were considered to be urgent matters but there was a certain amount of ambiguity in terms of what else would fall under this category so which obviously meant that it was left up to the discretion of the registry so we had some cases so as we know during this period and several studies and reports have documented this is that uh, women in particular 
in abusive households the incidence of domestic violence uh, increased manifold because you know these were times when women were trapped in abusive households and we i remember we were trying to get a matter filed uh, under the protection of women against domestic domestic violence and uh, an application under the pwda act and uh, the registry said you know given the fact that there are a bunch of bail applications that are pending this wouldn't constitute as an urgent application so a, largely a lot was contingent upon the discretion of the registry uh, which meant that there were several matters that were probably extremely pressing at a given point of time that weren't heard and i think this also trickled down to bail matters so for instance uh, one of our clients who was charged under the madhya pradesh excise act for possession of country liquor his bail application was rejected by both uh, the magistrate court and the sessions court and he belongs to a community which is known as the parthi community um, these this is a denotified tribal community and is on the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to both uh socio economic indicators and so we had this client of ours a 20 year old man who was suffering from tuberculosis and had been in prison uh and his bail applications like i said were rejected by uh the magistrates court and the sessions court and we had to wait for about a month for the application to be heard by the honorable high court and this was because of the sheer number of pendency of bail applications alone and as justice singh also rightly pointed out earlier courts have gradually progressed to now uh, being somewhat close to their full functioning capacity but i am talking about a matter and i am i am talking about this incident which dates back to april may right at the beginning of the lockdown when we were also trying to make sense of this public health crisis uh, that we were you know that we were confronted with and so listed by the registry and for two more weeks for the matter to actually be heard because it kept getting adjourned during due to the non availability of case diaries so you know these are some of the challenges that we faced particularly with regards to criminal matters right and also i think also in addition to the challenges that emerged during this period there were i think there are certain fundamental questions with regards to access to justice that became particularly pronounced during this period and one aspect of it is uh, the tediousness of processes right so in i mean of course just like everybody else several judges during this time who were affected by the virus so in in the recent in recent times actually uh, this, this is an incident from december we were trying to we had filed an appeal to the the sessions court uh, following the rejection of certain bail applications of a minor a 15 year old minor who had been charged for theft and house breaking and whose bail applications were rejected by the juvenile justice board and the judge who was required to hear the matter uh, had been non functional for a couple of weeks because she had uh, contracted covid while being on duty so we were i mean we had assumed that given the situation that we were confronted with it the charge would be handed over to a different judge but we were required to file a transfer application under 420 of the crpc so there are certain processes which of course have their merits but because we are confronted with these exceptional circumstances i think the tediousness of these processes uh, became particularly pronounced during this period so i think uh these are questions that were that had emerged and, and you know while we are talking about the criminal justice system i also want to you know locate questions and uh, you know troubles that the judiciary faced and lawyers faced during this period and locate it within the larger context of issues with the criminal justice system during this pandemic right so on 23rd march uh 2020 the supreme court passed a very important order it was a suo moto order uh which said that you know we need to carry out the congestion of prisons to avoid uh, the spread of the virus so the supreme court the honorable supreme court said that high courts you know state governments would have to constitute high powered committees at the state level which would then take cognizance of the question of overcrowding of courts and this was a very important and timely order because uh, we have prisons in this country and which are at and prisons across the country there's there's a national overcrowding rate of 117% which is the national overcrowding rate and which is particularly high for individual prisons 
so we we the supreme court you know in accordance with its jurisprudence said that uh, under trials and convicts who were incarcerated for offenses that are punishable by 7 years or less uh, should be considered for interim bail or parole and while this order was extremely timely and required we saw that the percentage of particularly in mp which is where i worked there was a research undertaken by uh, the criminal justice and police accountability project of which i am a part we saw the way in which arrests were made during this lockdown so we saw that a majority of arrests during that happened during this period uh, were for offenses punishable by 7 years or less so the supreme court's order from 2014 in arnesh kumar clearly says that you know arrest is uh, not mandatory for offenses punishable by 7 years or less the police can issue a notice under section 41a of the crpp and that this notice would ensure that there would be compliance with the investigating process and also uh, wouldn't require incarceration of the accused but we saw that a majority of the arrests that were made during this period happened under these provisions so section 188 under which the lockdown was imposed is a non bailable offence in the state of mp so we saw that a majority of arrests that were made under section 188 were also made uh, for offences under the excise act that are punishable by a maximum of 5 years for repeat offenders and this led to an overcrowding of prisons which was obviously in contravention to the order passed by the supreme court so i think and and i think the purpose of making this point is uh, to highlight that we, we were functioning during a during a time when access to liberty and access to justice was curtailed given uh, the pandemic situation and we had a police force that was functioning and that was arresting and carrying out uh, its functions and discharging its functions as usual in due course and resorting to over arrest so i think it's important that you know when we are thinking about questions of having a virtual system uh, and i think these are important questions that we have to think up think about i think question the question of digitization uh, is one that is crucial and uh, one that we need to play pay close attention to but i think it's also important for us to locate it in the within the in the context of the criminal justice system of course but also in the context of the larger socio economic a uh, background in which that we are operating right and this includes not just the diversity in the socio economic backgrounds of litigants a majority of whom belong to marginalized communities but also of lawyers themselves so uh, i think these are some questions to be cognizant of as we think about having this virtual system in place and transitioning uh, to a virtual system thank you uh, thanks nikita a uh, big thanks to all our panelists for their very insightful remarks um the, uh, your diverse experiences have really uh, added uh, a lot to the uh, whatever findings we had in our report uh, i'll ask uh, a couple of questions and then uh, we can take audience questions so i um, i mean uh, nikita has uh, touched upon uh, the digital divide and how that affects access to justice uh, this is a question for all of you how do you think that uh, we can bridge the div digital divide if we are looking at uh, a system of hybrid hearings in the future uh, justice singh i really think that the concept of having uh, wifi uh, pools across the country uh, like you know in the olden days we used to have std it isd booths we used to go to make uh, telephone calls on std so i think if we have that kind of a facility for the common man i think the digital divide can be easily uh, bridged the cyber cafes took off in the middle but then there was too much uh, wrong doing happening within the cyber cafes so i think we need to bring back the concept of cyber cafe with a much more uh, robust manner and have wi free wi fi i remember i think you know even a vegetable seller is permitted to have a wi fi router which he can allow a person to use i think that's the kind of system that will help to um, make uh, bridge the digital divide because then anyone who goes with a phone can easily immediately connect to the net and you know then access anything from there you know that's uh, thanks uh, mr paniala i feel that uh, the lawyers should uh, invest more on the it infrastructure 
this was not a priority uh, at the district bar level or semi urban level so lawyers should invest more and more on the it infrastructure that should be a priority and secondly lawyers team that is assisting team should be uh, upskilled to handle this kind of uh, online related activities whether it is e filing or uh, organizing scheduling the meetings and timely attending the meeting and ensuring that the uh, the, the valuable time given by the court for submissions are fully used without wasting the time of the court so these two things lawyer should invest on the infrastructure and his team should be upskilled to handle the internet related things nikita your thoughts uh, i think it's i think the question of bridging the digital divide is also tied to a larger question of uh, you know making the internet accessible to people across the board right so i think this is a more like i think this is a question that falls within the legislative domain of uh, you know policy making to see and to ensure that there is access to smartphones there's access to the internet because there are several parts of this country uh, where it's impossible to even make a phone call because there is no network so you know there are litigants uh, you know in these parts of the country who are trying to access the judicial system so i think there is of course it would be helpful uh, from an urban standpoint perhaps to create these zones where one can like justice singh said perhaps a cyber cafe or wifi zones but i think for it to be all encompassing uh, there will have to be a certain fundamental questions of accessibility uh, that the state will have to look into Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, maybe we can move on to audience questions because uh, we are running out of time. Uh, I'd like to uh, invite uh, Prashanto Sen to ask his question. Prashanto is a is a friend of Daksh and uh, was a great guide for us uh, in writing this report. Uh, he's a, a senior advocate who practices okay. in Delhi. Prashanto, so, uh, uh, very good evening to you, ma'am. Very good evening uh, to Mr. Panya. Good evening, Prashanto. Good to see you. <laughs> well it's uh, i i i don't have many any questions as such only two three uh, points to make uh, one is that uh, i've been an admirer of ducks and i have seen them working diligently without fanfare uh, regularly and when this opportunity came that they requested if you could if justice pratibha singh could come and speak i really took that up because justice pratibha singh also of course has been a very dynamic judge and i think here i want to make that point here to just three points uh, one is the change of mindset it was not so much anything else as a change of mindset which took place which this pandemic forced upon us and uh, i remember the last hearing i did just before the court closed and i said that next week there may not be anything there may be a lockdown and uh, judges were not very uh, uh, convinced about it but then when it closed we were really shocked and we were worried what would happen because as uh, kant had said that if justice perishes then human life becomes meaningless so for a for a bit we were really actually nervous as to what was happening because this was going on and then there was this response by the change i feel of mindset because the technology was there in fact from 2004 onwards in the judicial circles also there has been moved to digitalize etc so the technology was there and it came to fore but everyone's mindset changed and that's very important second the concept of court space changed today uh, it's not that you have to be going to a court as it is someone can be sitting in the comfort of the home can be connecting uh, one remembers that very famous incident where a judge once when he was i won't name the judge who was very upset with a ticket collector uh, sat down in the station and started uh, and started a court there and put some kind of uh, strictures now that was shocking at that time to hear of it but today uh, one uh, one looks at it and one sees actually that courts are in different pockets which are taking place so that is the first part change in mindset second change in mindset is the discipline in hearing because of the webex and other other uh, uh, other uh, um, uh, apps which are there there is a time frame within which people have to speak they don't speak out of turn because it is very jarring for the judge so the discipline has improved so i think that's a great thing and people try and stick to time that is a uh, second part now i feel that this is a historic opportunity i wanted to highlight this part uh, one is that i think delhi high court is amongst the courts which is uh, which which leads the way in many things including webex it's amongst the best apps i have tried jitsi i have tried the others uh, webex really works very well 
Second part is that as far as Delhi High Court is concerned, uh, the, I think there is more technology savvy involved. Already the filing etc. was far more smoother uh, than many of the High Courts. And I think here is a case where one can look forward to what other improvements one can make. And I was reading a very fascinating book by Siskin, who's an who's a, who's a expert in online courts. He's been writing about it since 84. And he talks about things like uh, one, the first phase would be where judges decide online cases which are there. And second, when I, AI takes over artificial intelligence and you have uh, you know, uh, clusters of cases which are small causes which have similar points being disposed of so that a lot of the backlog gets removed. The third important uh, fantastic opportunity which I see is that if there is enough investment in infrastructure and as the concept of space is changing, that is possible. In London, when this lockdown took place, churches were taken over as public spaces where people could come and even though they didn't have the infra infrastructure, access it. So I think something like that, as um, Nikita pointed out, state uh, sponsored maybe, where these spaces come up where lawyers who don't have access to uh, uh, infrastructure can make use of that infrastructure and take part in it and therefore one cannot have the, the the advantage would be the accessibility that is clients don't have to come all the way to the court many times if they're in far off places they don't have to come to the supreme court many times so the access to justice which once this infrastructure is built up which will take place would be fantastic so these are just one or two of the points which i wanted to uh, uh, bring um, to, to, to uh, forward. The one question which I would like to ask Justice Singh, uh, who's, I think, who's, who's in the thick of this entire thing is that uh, uh, the way forward, do you feel that uh, a large portion of uh, online hearings would take place or you feel only a very small portion would remain or we could uh, kind of progress much more uh, steadily in online hearings in a larger way than it has no, been? No, I've seen the reaction of lawyers to the reopening of physical courts in the last three, four days, um, I'm actually getting to feel that we would be going to courts more as judges and lawyers may get the option to choose whatever way they want. Because I'm realizing that um, the they realize for us, it's a full time thing that we have to be deciding cases one after the other. But lawyers realize now for the first time um, and litigators especially realized what corporate lawyers always used to say, you used, you go in the morning and you come back in the evening, you only do two cases, but we get 10 things out of the way. So now litigators realize, oh my God, these guys were right. So we can sit in our offices, do more opinions, get home early, have some good family time. So I think uh, the quality of life of litigating lawyers, they have experienced a better quality of life during the lockdown. And therefore I do feel that uh, you know, the hybrid system is where is the way it may go. So we may have monitors in court where the plaintiff lawyer may come to court and the different lawyer may say, I'll just join in through VC. I look at him on the screen, the plaintiff's lawyer looks at him on the screen. He argues and the matter is over. I think we are looking at that kind of a system where um, the option is with the lawyer. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Prashanto. Uh, we have another question uh, from an audience member. Uh, this is for Mr. Panyana and uh, Nikita. Uh, has, the, um, has the backlog of cases and limited hearings affected the lawyer community and their ability to assist their clients? How did clients respond to the limitations brought about by the pandemic? Uh, Nikita? I think it was an extremely difficult time because, uh, you know, bail applications, like I said, of course, you know, one is there is a general question of pendency of cases, uh, but it was very difficult to, uh, you know, negotiate with clients who had family members incarcerated during this period, particularly, uh, you know, family members of under trials uh, with comorbidities to reason with them and tell them that and also trying to, you know, explain the system to them because uh, this was an alien system for most people, including for us as lawyers, uh, like Mr. Sen said, to be able to, to for us to wrap our minds around it and to grapple with it and come to terms with it. So it was even more difficult for us to explain to clients and for us also, 
as lawyers to get an audience with client right so earlier uh, like you said in the report and the trials weren't being produced in court or were being selectively produced so uh, so for us to get an audience with client for with our clients and even for family members to uh, meet their you know for to meet and the trials who were in jails right because there was a complete cut, like lack of information jail mulaqats had been stopped uh, for the initial couple of months uh, before the phone call system was devised there was just absolute silence so we were it was i mean for us it was a difficult time to be able to uh, you know make sense of this system and communicate that to our clients also because uh we were also trying to grapple with the system as we were trying to explain it to them uh, mr panya yeah. your thoughts yeah. coming to the backlog of uh, cases it has not affected my kind of a practice i have a very a selective practice but this time has given me a lot of opportunity to do better job by going through the pleadings once again complete the legal research trying to find out new kind of interpretations given by the supreme court and the high courts and come up with more rulings and prepare the notes of argument and file that in advance so that assists the honorable judges to uh, appreciate the facts as well as the propositions of law that are uh, canvassed before the honorable court and i would say this time has given me a good quality time for Uh, revisiting my own cases and prioritizing and coming before the honorable judge with better quality job because just uh, imagine a, a regular practitioner will have not less than 6 or 8 or 10 cases listed every day in the normal physical hearing time so this time what happens only two cases are taken up so what happens i am able to dedicate more quality time so i would say my clients got uh, better uh, uh justice i would say in terms of presentation of the case before the honorable judges so and in fact uh, i mean the, the judiciary has appreciated this uh, we could present a better uh, legal uh, re- research based uh, judicial precedents so it has helped me in other way but number of cases may be still pending but definitely the cases that we have handled better inputs could be given to the court that's what i would say Oh, that's quite interesting uh the next question is for i would uh, i would add a sentence there to say that's my experience as a judge too you know with uh, when i have only 30 cases in a day i think i'm able to do more justice to 10 15 cases which get disposed of than when i have 50 cases or 60 when i'm just giving dates in matters so the quality of justice dispensation was much better i think yes oh. that that's definitely quite interesting uh the next question i think uh, this can be asked answered by all the panelists uh so did the pandemic accentuate the vagueness associated with what is an urgent hearing how do we ensure that urgent hearings can transcend beyond important mentionings by formidable lawyers uh justice singh uh initially we kept a very strict standard for urgent hearing just to see as to how much was the numbers that we were you know confronted with but uh, within a month or one and a half months the clear direction to the registry was wherever the lawyer felt it was urgent just list it so we reached a stage where almost the normal urgent hearing which used to be done in physical mode in fact we had more urgent hearing in uh, virtual mode so the initial one or two months i did i would say that we did kind of judge and see go slow kind of thing but after that i think it was completely open up okay mr paniala i never felt any difficulty in convincing the honorable judges about the urgency whenever we moved a, a memo mentioned the matter it was taken up uh, it was genuinely appreciated whenever we pointed out the urgency in the matter judges were never uh, uh shirking away always accommodate you i never faced that problem during this period in Probably fact judges, judges we do we used to feel you know give a chance to the lawyer because they are also earning during this pandemic we were very sympathetic to the cause of all of it nikita your experience 
Uh, I mean, like I already mentioned in my open remarks, I think there were two four challenges. One was, of course, uh, as the question mentions, the lack of clarity about you know urgent matters themselves because courts weren't functioning at full capacity. So the number of matters that uh, were being heard had you know the numbers had dwindled. So one was to be able to get the matters listed, of course, and you know we were also looking at a time. And I, I keep going back to bail matters because I think these were applications that were mostly heard during uh, this period. And in you know, in in case of bail applications, uh, because of course most applications had that sort of urgency. Uh, you know, given the pressing circumstances, there was of course there were some applications and applications of certain kinds of litigants that fell through the cracks. And to answer the second part of the question, whether uh, you know, there were certain formidable lawyers who were able to get a better audience. I think it was also, I mean, of course, like I said earlier, uh, we are ultimately grappling with a system of senior counsels uh, that has been the subject matter of critique. So that that is an issue that has persisted throughout. Uh, but this was also a time where the where access for certain lawyers was completely cut off because. Uh, they didn't have access to the digital infrastructure that was required for them to appear in court. Uh, so these were twofold issues uh, when it came to urgent matters that uh, we, you know, grappled with in my experience. Thanks a lot. Uh, Justice Singh, uh, going back to your point about how you said that uh, you were able to hear the matters better, maybe this is a case for us to rationalize the uh, process of scheduling cases. Maybe we shouldn't be listing 50 cases a day anyway. So I think that's something. I, I think is, uh, so long as we have pressure of quantum, this will continue. That will only ease when uh, we have sufficient number of judges to deal with all the cases at all levels and uh, that yeah. is completely easy and I think that uh, that's one area where we need to kind of uh, beef up our appointments and everything. Yes, yes, true. Okay, uh, one more question uh, from the audience. Uh, in some instances, uh, bar associations were called upon to uh, help in streamlining of filing and other processes during the pandemic. How do we take this engagement with the bar forward post the pandemic? Uh, just a second. Um, I think uh, the bar and the bench are, as they say, two sides of the same coin. Um, and I think more also, you know, my experience in England, for example, would show uh, if you if you walk in any of the inns or any of the barristers' chambers, there's so much cordiality and informal uh, informality between uh, judges and lawyers. And that is, uh, I think I've been in a city like Delhi where we do interact with much less um, hesitation with lawyers. Most of the times our decisions are taken after, I mean, after speaking to the lawyers. Even when we were lawyers, we were able to speak to judges and judges are able to speak to lawyers. Uh, but I don't think that that's the same thing across the country. I, I would think that uh, lawyers, associations, etc., uh, are quite uh, uh, conscious and they are very, uh, very active. And I don't see any harm to one level of interaction and involvement of lawyers. Uh, Mr. Paniala, your thoughts? I have always consciously tried to distance myself from the honorable judges for two reasons. One is that I only know the law. I don't know the judges, number one. Number two, uh, we do not want to in any way affect the reputation of the honorable judges. Uh, we do not want uh, honorable judges' uh, integrity being questioned or um, the common man loses the faith in the uh, system. So we want honor honorable judges to be held in very high esteem. So I always distanced. Uh, but whenever I get an opportunity, a very healthy uh, discussions on academic as well as professional side does take place. But uh, my relationship with the honorable judges is uh, the minimum, minimum only in the courtroom. Uh, outside that, I just don't want to be associated or socializing with them, even in the court campuses. That's my personal uh, principle. 
Okay, but sir, in the event uh, we are moving to a system where there are hybrid hearings, do you think the bar associations can help with dealing with the infrastructural challenges? Definitely, I would say bar associations should set up centers within the court campuses or uh, one or two locations which is convenient if it is uh, uh, bigger cities uh, to uh, support and assist the lawyers who are not tech savvy to make use of this uh, uh, facility in the sense technological advancement should reach each and every lawyer. I think senior advocates or those lawyers who are not uh, well versed should not be left out. I think everybody should have uh, uh, equal opportunity to present uh, their clients cases effectively before the judiciary. Because after all, the common man who is the victim, who is the one who is the beneficiary of the justice, he should not be deprived of. Bar Association should come forward and try to give all kind of support, both infrastructural as well as trainings. Uh, upskilling the younger generation or maybe the, in this case senior gen senior lawyers not the younger lawyers Nikita, your thought? Yeah, sorry could you please repeat the question is the role of bar associations right yes 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 in facilitating this process yeah and I how think, do we take this engagement forward even yeah i think it's, it's i think bar associations in my view play a crucial role uh, in also facilitating the dialogue between various stakeholders of the judicial system, right? So if we are going to transition uh, to a system that's going to be hybrid, uh, then I think bar associations, for bar associations to step up and to, you know, bring to the table challenges that are faced by lawyers, litigants, uh, to, you know, to the, to the bench and to also facilitate that dialogue. I think they play a crucial role. And I think there are several bar associations during this period who've done that as well. We saw that happen in Gujarat when the Gujarat Bar Association uh, took up certain issues with, you know, listing of matters, etc., and challenges that lawyers face during this period uh, with the High Court. So I think uh, it's it's really crucial. I think ro a role that the bar association has to play during uh, this period, to especially to facilitate this transition. Oh, okay. I think we have time for one last question. Uh, this, I think, again, can be taken by all the panelists. Uh, does this promise of increased lawyer productivity also suggest faster dispensation of justice and reduction of backlogs? Uh, Justice Singh? Absolutely. I think uh, they have much better, as uh, Mr. Panyala has already said, they have much more quality time in their offices. They will tend to take lesser adjournments in courts because they would be prepared. And secondly, we need to figure out one thing. And that is what I still have to figure out in my own head, I feel, how to conduct trial through online platforms. Right. And yes. uh, that's where I still uh, have to reconcile myself as to how do we use electronic record and uh, the old system of Evidence Act and uh, CPC will need to be relooked at and conducting trials through online will be so easy and so much more faster for justice dispensation because clients won't need to travel witnesses won't need to travel and the court commissioner can be there online to make sure that everything is being done properly transcription can be done by transcription software and i think we are looking at a complete uh, robust trial mechanism going forward. I mean, I just need to, I feel that we should start using uh, as an arbitration cases. That's one example, which I, which readily comes to me. Uh, normally in arbitration cases, before we start a witness examination, lawyers sit across the, uh, you know, and uh, table and we agree on, we used to agree on the binders, binder one, binder two, binder three, binder four, pleadings, documents, exhibit numbers, everything is done. So then you would just take the witness and say, okay, come to exhibit 28, exhibit 24. All that thing about PW1, PW2, PW3, RW1, that, that system needs to be changed, I think. And uh, I really, I'm looking forward to seeing a reform in trial processes, both in civil and in criminal cases. Uh, it would be a big boon to our system if we can have online trials. And it would be excellent if we could have, you know, while the judge is holding court, uh, we can have judge managers or court managers who oversee trials being conducted or a court commissioner. So parallelly, you have double productivity then. 
Yes. I think. Uh, yeah, very interesting. Also, I mean, at that we always say that you know, uh, digitization shouldn't just be about uh, digitizing uh, paper-based processes. It should be about transforming the process itself, because right. you know, by using these kind of technologies, you can become much more effective and efficient. And require uh, suppose it's a witness, I should be able to say, okay, I'm share screening this exhibit. Is this your signature? Mark it. Point F right there. It yes. could be. Done electronically is what I'm saying. Yes. You yeah. need not have yeah. paper, and witnesses will not need to travel. Cost costs of litigation will come down tremendously. Lawyers' billable hours will be lesser because today, when a lawyer gets up from his office, go to court, and come back, if he has two cases, he bills the whole day to the two cli clients. Whereas if he's sitting in office, he will be billing half an hour, half an hour for a client, and he'll be using the remaining six hours to bill other clients. So I think there's more quality time, and um, I really think that this would be a big reform if we can, if we are able to achieve it in the in the online platform. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Nikita, your thoughts? There was a brief lag in connection, Julia. Could you repeat that? The question. Uh, yeah, does this promise of increased lawyer productivity also suggest faster dispensation of justice and reduction of backlogs? Uh, I mean, I think faster, I, I mean, like Justice Singh said, I think there will have to be a reimagination of how trials will be conducted. I mean, there, especially with documents, I, I think I can completely attest to this that uh, having more digitized forms of documents would be extremely valuable because uh, I think the system of having everything in files and hard copies is one that's extremely tedious uh, for lawyers. But I, I also wonder in terms of, uh, you know, addressing the question of backlog and increasing the productivity of lawyers. I, I'm a bit, I'm a, I don't know, I'm a bit skeptical about that because the question of backlog uh, is one that is not related to digitization alone. It's one uh, that is also related to more like fundamental questions of, uh, you know, how like for matters to be heard and also the number of uh, cases that are also coming to court, right? Because there are writ petitions uh, that are being filed. There are also like, for instance, during this period, uh, there are a lot of cases where maybe we don't need to come to court and there are uh, so these these are matters uh, that are being litigated in court so i think the question of pendency will have to be addressed on multiple counts as far uh, as the number of you know lawyers work being more productive is concerned i think uh, that is a question that will also have to uh, be addressed by making sure that we have you know, lawyers that are also accessible to for a vast number of litigants, because I think at this point, uh, there is heavy dependence on uh, like a full few number of lawyers that, you know, litigants trust uh, for certain matters to be heard and for, uh, you know, to argue their cases effectively. So I think there will have to be a greater investment uh, in building that sort of legal academy and building uh, that sort of cadre of lawyers so that uh, the sort of questions of productivity and over uh, burden that a certain set of lawyers feel uh, will for that to be addressed. Yes, that's true. I, Pariana, I, I don't know why, uh, why you say that because my own feeling is that the online platform has made it more egalitarian. Hmm. We, we, uh, we are able to now, the younger lawyers are getting an equal audience in the court on online platforms. That's no, my... no, no. Certainly, younger lawyers are getting an audience, but uh, there are also because there is a lack of homogeneity also within that category of younger lawyers and lawyers who are trying to access that system. There is a certain because you know which is what the point I was making earlier. The privilege there are, it's easier. Yeah, it's easier. Privilege, yeah, which is where lawyers like myself who have always had an had access to a laptop and have always been tech savvy. Uh, have made full use of this time. I think it's worked wonders for us. But of course, there are so many of my peers who have also immensely struggled I during this period. I and I think, point. yeah, those are, you know, questions and those are struggles that I all think need to be centered. Uh, Mr. Panyala, your thoughts? 
yeah definitely it is going to increase the lawyer's productivity because when you have quality time you can do a lot of preparations when a well researched and well prepared case only can be presented before the court effectively so i have no doubt about the success the uh, i would say this is a revolutionary change the reason why i say is that the brightest legal minds are not attracted to the litigation these days we have seen this in the last uh, few years uh, since this online platform is available uh, the, the bright minds are attracted towards litigation because they felt that spending time in the court from morning till night i mean till evening continuously without getting the matter listed is a waste of time so the bright uh, legal minds have always opted for corporate law practice or uh, joining the companies as law officers or other revenues so here is an opportunity for the new generation lawyers to come prepare directly come and address the honorable judges and uh, uh, look for the brighter side here so i am really happy and i see hope in this to attract the best minds i would say yes very interesting uh, we've run out of time so now we need to wind up uh, a big thanks to our stellar panel uh, justice singh mr panyala and nikita uh, you've all brought your very diverse and uh, deep insights to this discussion this has been very useful for us and i'm sure for the audience as well uh, thanks to the audience who's taken out time to attend today's webinar uh, i understand there's a lot of webinar fatigue nowadays so we are very grateful to you for uh, actually sparing time for this uh, this webinar will be available on youtube once the stream is over uh, thanks again uh, good night stay safe thanks thank for the you. opportunity nice thank meeting you. all thank, nice thank, you. Meeting. thank you so much bye. thank you very much ma'am thank you thank bye bye, -bye.